Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Nira Wasserman, the director of the Center for Jewish Ethics at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. And in a moment, I will have the pleasure of introducing today's lecturer, Professor Shauna Sippy. Uh, please note that our schedule today is a little different than in previous weeks, as this is the last lecture in our series. After today's lecture and the Q&A, we will be staying on for a roundtable discussion that will allow us to draw some of the overarching themes of the series as a whole together and to reflect on what we've learned. Today's speaker, Professor Shauna Sippy, will be staying on, and we will also be joined by Dr. Ana Lucia Lopez Reveredo at that time. So the program as a whole today will extend till 3 p.m. As this is the last lecture in our semester long series, I want to take this moment to express some gratitude. This lecture series comes from a partnership between the Center for Jewish Ethics and the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. We are grateful for a grant from the Campaign for Community from Penn's Office of the Provost and also for support from the SNF PIDEA program at Penn. I want to thank Professor Steve Weitzman, director of the CAT Center, for his initial vision in bringing this lecture series together for all of his work and for his partnership. And I also want to thank the staff members at the CAT Center who have worked on all of these programs. Behind the scenes are Diana Dennis Walters, Brian Lipscomb and Becky Friedman. And at the end of today's lecture, you will meet the CAT Center's Director of Public Programs, Dr. Ann Albert, as well as Steve Weitzman, who will participate in the Q&A. I also wanna thank Ethics Center Rabbinic Intern, Armin Langer, who oversaw the website that accompanies this series, and we'll be sharing a link for that as well. Thanks to all the participants, to all of you who have been joining us. Thank you for your active engagement. We missed seeing your faces and hearing your voices, but have appreciated all the insights and questions shared on the Q&A and hope that will continue today with the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. We, the organizers, are also hoping to benefit from your insights further. And we'll be shortly uh, this afternoon sending an email with a short survey and an invitation for more feedback on the series and on what future learning opportunities would interest you. And now, I'm very excited to be able to introduce today's speaker. Shauna Sippy is Assistant Professor of Religion at Center College, where her work focuses on interactions of religious, cultural and racial identities among diverse communities, especially those of Jews and of Hindus in the United States and around the world. Professor Sippy pursues ethnographic research as well as cutting edge theoretical work and has a deep commitment to the communities she studies. She makes change wherever she goes. And even as she is organizing faculty and students to confront racism at Center College where she now teaches, she remains deeply connected to the diverse religious communities of Minnesota, where she previously taught at Carleton College. So on the website uh, accompanying this series, we will shortly be posting some of the ongoing work she is pursuing as co-director of the Religious Diversity in Minnesota Initiative, including links to some of the short documentaries she worked on for public television. I want to thank Professor Sippy for joining us today and also for being an active participant and a conversation partner as the series unfolded throughout the semester. She has graciously agreed both to slightly shorten the Q&A session following her talk, which will be about a half an hour, and to stay beyond that to participate in our closing roundtable, which again will extend to 3 p.m. Her presentation is titled Purity Politics and the Problem of Jewish Solidarity. Welcome, Professor Sippy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, firstly, I want to thank the CAT Center and professors Rabbi Mira Wasserman and Steve Weitzman for inviting me to be part of this rich series of talks, which I know are only a piece of larger, longstanding, and ongoing conversations 
about the interrelationship between race, religion, and Judaism. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. So giving the last talk in this series is somewhat daunting and it was tempting, I'll admit, just to throw out my paper and uh, simply follow some of the many rich threads of discussion that were raised over the past couple of months. However, I wasn't so radical. I've stuck to my plan to consider purity politics and the problem of Jewish solidarity. My goal today is to engage in a heuristic exercise together. I'm not making grand claims in this talk, but I wish to ask what might we learn or newly consider as a result of bringing a number of different ideas and theories about purity, religion, race, Jewishness, and the politics of solidarity into conversation with one another. So to give you just a, a brief outline of some of the ideas I hope to explore, and it's ambitious, so I'm gonna run through them relatively quickly. I want us to consider the religious conceptions of purity, the co-constitution of religion and race, conceptions of racial purity, theories of solidarity, and then look very briefly at some case studies that I'm just gonna sort of introduce, and then I'll have some concluding thoughts um, and questions to share. So to begin with, the concept of purity in religious traditions and Judaism more specifically is something that many of us are quite familiar with. As a general rule, discussions of purity and impurity in religions don't tend to raise red flags. It's just what religions do. First and foremost, though, we need to understand that purity and impurity are embodied. Impurity is the state of a thing and can be imparted onto someone or something. It's contagious. We're most familiar, for example, with the ideas of impurity and purity in the laws of Tahara Mishpacha, the laws of family purity, which render a menstruating woman pure or impure, depending not only on whether she's currently bleeding, but also how recently she has been in contact with that blood. This is true as well with respect to contact with a corpse or carrion, for example. So when status is based on their proximity to impurity in space, matter, and time. Tahara is a state of ritual purity and, and impurity is imparted by and through a host of things and activities. So many of us have been deeply influenced, oops, sorry, hold on, <laughs> by the work of social anthropologist, Mary Douglas, who wrote in her book, Natural Symbols, the human body is always treated as an image of society. And scholars of religion were taught to read discourses of purity and impurity as natural human processes establishing boundaries, making order out of chaos, distinctions between categories of things and people. The laws of Kashrut, for example, do many things. They make the quotidian sacred as with many other embodied Jewish ritual practices, but at the same time, they establish hard lines of division, creating strict laws around food serves powerfully to separate Jews from non-Jews. The laws of Tahara Mishpacha function in a similar way. While there are many interpretations and experiences that shift how individuals relate to and find meaning in particular practices, the rituals unquestionably function to draw dividing lines between people based on the grounds of embodied difference. An image of society is mapped onto biological sex, deeming some things and people more pure or impure in a hierarchical system that establishes in this case men as more pure more of the time than are women. So embodied purity and impurity does not reflect a neutral ordering of chaos, rather they reveal systems. And Douglas famously wrote that if we can abstract from the notion of dirt, understanding dirt is matter out of place, it implies a set of ordered relations and a contravention to that order. It's never a unique or isolated event, but the byproduct of systematic ordering and classification of matter in so far as ordering involves rejecting inappropriate elements. However, as many critical theorists have pointed out, Douglas misses something. We must go beyond her to think about the aspect of purity discourse and practices that involve the rejecting of inappropriate elements. How lovely, right? If you're deemed appropriate, a member of the collective we that is pure, and that's what she focused on generally. That classification can be a unifying process for those who find themselves deemed inside the boundary of purity. But the system requires something that some things and some people be rejected. Scholars such as Robbie Dushinsky note that the designation of pure and impure oops, is an assessment of the essence of a thing, a person or a body. He suggests that in Western societies, themes of purity and impurity are best understood as an assessment of their relative self identity. 
of something or someone, their qualitative homogeneity or their essence. So we see this in nationalism all the time, right? A citizen, he notes, is taken by nationalist discourse to be pure if they're in some sense the same, homogenous with other members of the nation, and that's their essence. The suggestion that he makes here is that the act of assessment of discerning pure and impure involves a categorization of subjects, groups, things based on their proximity or distance from this some ideal of homogeneity, of purity, of essence or truth. But the determination of this purity, the essence of the thing is subjective and unstable. And in revising her own work, Mary Douglas noted that there is no natural desire for cognitive or social order at the base of purity or impurity designations, and there's no intrinsic value to purity for the individual society. While it may indeed be used as it is in Jewish ritual and tradition to delineate what is sacred from what is not, she argued that the only thing universalistic about purity is the tendency to use it as a weapon or tool. And we're quite familiar with the ways in which purity discourse functions as a weapon, discourse that views those people as the problem. Recent police shootings, the latest of a 15-year-old Micaiah Bryant on Tuesday is an ongoing reminder of the ways that processes of assessment happen as part of the order of things, determining what and who is expendable or must be rejected. But why, you might ask, am I making a connection between racism and conceptions of religious purity? They seem quite different. But the ways in which we talk about and understand race today often mask racism's historic relationship to notions of purity. Indeed, purity, even in the Levitical context, is about ideas of embodied impurity, about conceptions of taint, and contamination that are carried by bodies. And it's not uncommon to hear the rituals of family purity, for example, reimagined and viewed as empowering, but we don't see that with racial purity. There's no good ethics that would do that. But in fact, racial and religious purity cannot be disaggregated just as race and religion can't be. And we must attend to their co-constitution if we're, what this series has sought to do, if we're actually going to understand how these categories are mobilized. And although they're mobilized often as separate categories, their history has kept them entangled. So, oh, sorry. as noted, purity and impurity don't actually function within a given religious tradition only. They are also categories that have been used to distinguish between different religious groups. We know this well with respect to ideas of purity of blood. As Irene Silverblatt states in her work, Modern Inquisitions, tracing the modern world back to the 16th century lets us get a better grasp on another of the modern world's deceits, state fetishism. Veiling our origins in a globalizing hierarchical world has also veiled our origins in race thinking. It has made us lose sight of our colonial foundations and of the antagonistic social relationships at its core. Yes, race thinking, nationalist sentiments, bureaucratic rule, colonialism, and the nascent capitalist economic order girding them had different roots and different paths, but history joined them 500 years ago, and history accordingly paved the way for an onslaught of often deadly confusions. Silverblatt goes on to talk about this race thinking that emerges, and that in fact, inquisitors were charged with certifying Spanish purity of blood, which was defined as the absence of Jewish or Moorish blood, right, and overseeing religious orthodoxy, which was assessed based on purity of blood. So the idea of blood purity wasn't limited, though, to the Inquisition. Religious difference, skin color, geographic origin all coalesce in Orientalist and colonial definitions of race. The processes of racialization were intimately linked to ideas about the relative purity or impurity of particular groups, particular religions, who were in fact distinct races, Hindus, Jews, Moors, Christians. Atiyah Hussein notes that race is a political system operating on multiple levels that emerge from the context of European expansion in the modern era through violence, including conquest, slavery, and colonization. Religion, specifically Christianity, was used to provide ideological support for this violence through the citing of religious texts and attempts to convert colonized populations. Additionally, the black, white, or white, non-white logic that racism rests on is based on the binary logic of Christian heathen in which religion is also a way to identify and categorize bodies. 
She says that due to this context, race signifies superiority and inferiority with reference to phenotype, geography, culture, and religion, which are all written onto the body as a site of difference. And so race has always been perpetually entangled with the category of religion. And is always marked, as she said, with religious difference and in, must be understood in the context of systems of power, which were used as a way to organize bodies and identify them who could be colonized and who couldn't be. So she says that in order for scholarship to take seriously that religion is always implicit with, in discussions of race is absolutely critical. And that since the moment race was born in early modern Europe, religion was racialized. And after that moment, she says, religion is embedded in the social, racialized social system. And so the question scholars should be asking is not if religious groups are racialized, but how and to what end. So religion lives on within the concept of race. And so, for example, while both skin color and religion existed before the category of race, they were, she notes, essential to its construction and given new significance upon being racialized. So it's typically unnecessary to make an argument for how skin color was racialized centuries ago and fuels contemporary racial processes. And with respect to Jewish history, the, the relationship between religious identity and racial purity should come as no surprise, not just in the Inquisition or in the ways in which the very category of religion emerged as part of an Orientalist and colonial project that understood Jews and Judaism as a less evolved race, one that had been superseded by Christianity. But in Nazi Germany as well, we see how conceptions of religious and racial purity were championed by racial science that was merged with the nationalist project, blood and soil. At work in nationalisms are notions of pure blood of the national body who can be contaminated, polluted by the impure blood of the Jew, the immigrant, the African, but also the pure blood of a nation's sons when spilled in sacrifice, sanctify the soil, right? So you have both aspects of the purity of blood at work. And while purity and impurity in Judaism, for example, was not traditionally linked to a person's moral status, Zoltan Balas notes that in Christian thought, which lays the foundation for our modern definitions of both race and religion, the idea of purity was also not just bodily, but as Kierkegaard put it, about a purity of heart, a sign of virtue and morality that was not just action, but intention. And such ideas about inherent virtue were associated with a particular race and a religion, white Christians and not with others, Jews, pagans, Muslims, Arabs, Africans, Hindus. So what does this relationship between race and religion mean for Jewish identity? Although since the Holocaust in particular, Jewish thinkers have sought to distance themselves from defining Jews as a race, favoring the idea of Judaism as a religion, making that distinction is all the more complicated because the two categories are imbricated as we have seen. And I think it's important to note that ideas about Jews as a race were found within the Christian world, regardless of what color skin Jews had. Jews of color and white Jews were still racialized as Jews, even if and when they were other things as well. Well, there have always been Jews of color, color wasn't always interpreted as race. Furthermore, we know well from the work of scholars like Leora Benitsky, among others, that the notion of Judaism as a religion, like the category of religion itself, is a modern idea that has never fully captured the whole of Jewish identity. Jews haven't ever fully discarded the idea that they are an ethnicity or a race, even as Jews and Judaism have become other things, a religion, a culture, a people, and after the founding of the state of Israel, a nation. So now you might ask, what does all this have to do with contemporary Jewry and the matter of solidarity. How I want to ask have these notions of purity and impurity of race and religion function to shape the very contours of contemporary political solidarity. If you're willing to accept the presupposition thus far that race and religion are intertwined and that they're related to conceptions of purity and impurity, then I wanna argue that while not always explicit, these discourses and systems entangling race, religion, purity and impurity are always still at work when religious and racial groups stand in solidarity with or in opposition to one another. The very notion of political solidarity rests on the idea that different groups of people come together to work toward a common goal. In her book, Race and the Politics of Solidarity, Juliet Hooker considers what forms the basis for solidarities and why certain solidarities are more likely than others. She writes, racial seeing has tremendous consequences for political solidarity as solidarity is crucially dependent on vision and imagination. It's not accidental that um, 
excuse me, sorry. I just lost my screen. Um, it's not accidental that solidarity is routinely described in terms of the capacity to envision a shared collective identity. And she points to Richard Rorty's claim that our sense of solidarity is strongest when those with whom solidarity is expressed are thought of as one of us. The embodied dimension of race, she notes, means that it operates through visible markers of difference so that racial others are not only invisible morally, but have actually been seen as invisible, inferior and thus not imagined as part of a desired collective. So drawing on Rorty, Hooker maintains that solidarity is always affective in the sense that, quote, feelings of solidarity are necessarily a matter of which similarities and dissimilarities strike us as salient. Which similarities and dissimilarities strike us as salient? And because solidarity is based on what Rorty calls fellow feeling, then to form solidarities which by nature involve bridging difference requires imagination. And Hooker describes this as the imaginative ability to see strange people as fellow sufferers. She suggests that solidarity should be created by increasing our sensitivity to the particular details of the pain and humiliation of others, unfamiliar sorts of people. Such increased sensitivity makes it difficult to marginalize people different from ourselves. So then if this is the case, if solidarities are matters of which solid similarities and dissimilarities strike us as salient, why has the organized Jewish community so often chosen to align with evangelical Christian Zionist anti-Semites, but been ambivalent at best not even about solidarities, but simply conversations or listening to lectures about a whole host of issues by activists or groups, including Muslim organizations, activists in BLM, and even Jewish groups who have supported Palestinian liberation or been associated with the BDS movement. For a moment, I want to think about Christian evangelicalism and its relationship to conceptions of racial purity. In her work on white evangelical racism, Penn professor Anthea Butler notes that in the 1970s, Reverend Bob Jones III was worried less about immorality and its relationship to communism than he was about interracial relationships. Building on the Hebrew Bible admonitions against Israelite intermixing with non-Israelites, evangelical Christians argued whites should not mix with non-whites. And both Randall Balmer and Butler make clear that it was racism, not abortion, that explains the rise of evangelical political activism in the 70s. So while there is no doubt that this racist framework viewed Black people as impure, elevating white women as the most pure, in a hierarchy, Jews weren't far behind Black people. And yet it's at this same time that evangelical groups were actively mobilizing against a culture that was pushing racial integration that Christian Zionism emerges as a force in American religious and political discourse. Many evangelical Christians saw the 67 war as a sign. And as Aaron Engberg puts it, generally understood the Israeli victory in terms of prophetic fulfillment. The time of the Gentiles had ended and the temple was going to be rebuilt. So for the rapture to commence, right, Jews have to return to the land. And when the apocalypse comes, those like the Jews who have not accepted Jesus will, like all other sinners, be judged and sentenced to eternal damnation. The religious fervor among evangelicals that was sparked in the wake of 67 only grew, and Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion's government viewed it as advantageous to build a relationship with evangelicals. Since the 70s, that relationship has only gotten stronger. And Yaakov Ariel notes that Jewish secular leaders chose very actively to look the other way, even in the face of evangelical Christian missionary efforts, so that they would maintain this strong relationship with American Christian Zionist groups, assuring them that they would not interfere with their work. Indeed, it wasn't only secular Jews, but in 1988, Ariel notes that the magazine Nekuda Settlement, an organ of, of the Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria, published an article praising the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem and said that they, unlike many Jews, realized that the Bible authorized the Jews to settle their land. So while Zionist alliances with anti-Semites who sought to deal with the Jewish problem by helping them rid the Europe of the Jews go back to the 19th century, and there's always been anti-Semitism at the core of Christian Zionism, even when it's mixed with philo-Semitism, as Jim Sleeper put it, 
Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, and perhaps most notably John Hagee professed their great love for Jews in America with the unparalleled hypocrisy of men serenely confident of God's real plan, bringing an end to Jews and all non-believers in the Holy Land. And this is how among the insurrectionists on January 6th, we saw Israeli flags alongside six million is not enough t-shirts. This is not a contradiction. And anyone who is surprised by this has simply, I am sorry, not paid attention to the rhetoric. The choice to engage with Christian evangelicals from the beginning required, I would argue, a type of cognitive dissonance, or to use the language of Linda Alcott, a willful ignorance, which she said is not a matter of neglect, but a substantive epistemic practice in which ignorance emerges from cognitive norms, structural privilege, and situated identities. So why has there been such an active forgetting, a willful ignorance about the frightening realities of anti-Semitism, as well as every other imaginable form of hate among evangelical Christian Zionists? The strange part about this alliance, I would say, is that while we might expect a kind of ideological purity test to be applied to these groups, rendering them impure because of their deep-seated anti-Semitism, the organized Jewish community has inverted the paradigm. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it was consistent with how purity politics have traditionally worked. While a single drop of black blood or Jewish blood rendered a whole classes of people impure, people who are not seen as equal or allies in marriage, social life, or politics, the opposite form of purity test was always afforded to pure white Christians. What we are seeing here is that the organized Jewish community has practiced a form of ideological purity that maps onto racial purity. Profession of Zionism, of support for Israel, renders a group pure. It's willing to form solidarities with white nationalist Christian movement. And I don't think we can just write this off as a kind of tunnel vision that's concerned only with politics around Israel, although that's most certainly part of this. On the other hand, I want to compare this to the insatiable zealousness when it comes to searching out the possible taint uh, that is carried by associations and politics of those who might be supporters of BDS. And when we might say the issue is Israel and its survival, I think there's something else at work as well, and it is connected to purity politics. I wanna suggest that the deliberate choice to privilege and prioritize these solidarities, which put American Jews and other marginalized groups in peril over other solidarities needs to be understood as a structural response to racism. As has often been the case with minorities who've tried to leverage proximity to whiteness to gain power, the organized Jewish community has tried to leverage Israel as a way to gain access to white supremacist power because those white Christian supremacists are, we know all too well, more powerful than other marginalized groups like black people or Muslims. So while I don't have the full time to go into what I'd like to with respect to looking at the Jewish community's policing of the boundaries of acceptable discourse about Israel, and who Jewish organizations can partner with, what we can see is that there have been strict disciplinary practices, a vigilance that stands in stark contrast to the willful ignorance at work in Christian Zionists and Jewish solidarities. For example, Hillel has these very strict policies that include that they will not host, house, or partner with organizations, groups, or speakers that is a matter of policy practice or support boycott of or divestment from or sanctions against the state of Israel, along with these other things, right? But we need to understand that BIPOC communities have long understood that the oppression of one group is linked to the oppression of another. People have found strength in solidarity. And groups like Open Hillel founded in 2012 were created in response to this sense. And I, so I, there's a, a whole bunch of examples that I could look at, including the, the multiple times that Hillel sort of canceled events, protested events, uh, protested Angela Davis's speaking because of her, um, you know, a Brandeis graduate Angela Davis is speaking at, at talks because of her support for BDS. And what I want to sort of think about here and, and sort of move to is that this kind of ideological purity, the sort of one drop of blood test that's put on BDS means that we are not engaging or in solidarity with uh, so many groups that might actually be very productive alliances, right? And, and might lead to very important and productive conversations. So I'll end by saying that I believe that no scholarship is neutral. 
And while what we do is always political, the question is only how we choose to recognize the political implications of our work, what kinds of questions we ask and how we direct them towards broader political processes in the world. In her book, Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times, Alexis Shotwell names the fact that there's no food we can eat, clothing we can buy, or energy we can use without deepening our ties to complex webs of suffering. She seeks to consider what she calls the usefulness of thinking about complicity and compromise as a starting point for action. The idea that there can never be pure bodies or pure races or pure ideologies is not only a fallacy, that, that there can ever be them is not only a fallacy, but it is profoundly dangerous. Purity thinking has, in the case of the organized Jewish community, meant that all the anti-Semitic, racist, sexist discourse in evangelical Zionism was overlooked because of the perceived purity of support for Israel. But I hope even with the little bit that I was able to cover today that I made clear that there's nothing pure about that alliance, the compromises it involves not only deny the humanity of Palestinians as a matter of concern, but they put Jews and Blacks and Muslims and other minorities, as well as women's autonomy, over their own bodies in peril. So what's been the cost of that alliance, an alliance that shows white supremacy, that involved the Jewish communities leveraging a desired proximity to white Christianness, what has that gained us? More years of Netanyahu, more settlements, more suffering? In the case of both Jews and non-Jews who support Palestinian rights and even BDS, Purity politics has meant that fear of contamination has precluded discourse and solidarity with peoples whose concerns, whose position, whose engagement might be very productive. If solidarity is most powerful when we are able to see one another's suffering, then maybe that should be our criteria for engagement. We always have to compromise. There's no purity because purity is a system of domination. Shotwell argues against purism because it's a bad approach. It shuts down precisely the field of possibility, she says, that, quote, might allow us to take better collective action against the destruction of the world. Purism is a decollectivizing, demobilizing, paradoxical politics of despair. The fact is that purity discourses and ideologies always privilege one thing, one aspect of being or thought over others a single drop of blood, a single ideological position that changes one person's status from pure, acceptable to unacceptable or impure. The very nature of purity practices that they function metonymically, viewing a single part as a contaminant that renders the whole impure. And this is what's happened with progressive organizations whose solidarity with Palestinians has been deemed unacceptable. But all alliances are not equal, and none of us can be pure in our own commitments or investments. For Jews of color, specifically Black Jews, to shun from Jewish spaces thinkers like Angela Davis and call into question, as was done, the possibility of Jewish support for BLM because there have been expressions of solidarities with Palestinian liberation groups is particularly painful. I want to suggest that rather than forging solidarities based on notion of purity in order to gain power, we challenge the system and norms and actually consider the power that might come from solidarities with those whom commitments are complicated, but whose suffering we can see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for a, a, a really intriguing, um, rich, and provocative talk. So uh, I have the opportunity to start off um, a short exchange with you. And um, you, you so helpfully demonstrate how the logic of purity in religious life maps onto the logic of purity in racial thinking and the logic of purity in ideological and political um, alliance making. I wanna go back to the Jews some more. Um, and um, I don't know quite what the question is, but I think I share with some of our listeners how disturbing it is to, to be confronted with, um, with your suggestion that there's a logic of racial purity underly underlying Jewish politics. Um, and I wonder if you can speak to, to what degree is this the logic of purity? And to what degree is it just power, pure and simple? Because as you noted, we live in a racialized society 
where power is with white evangelicals and um, and not with these other marginalized groups. And if you are truly concerned about uh, the survival of Israel, uh, the flourishing of Jewish people worldwide, doesn't it make good sense to align yourself with the people in power uh, and not with the people who've been unjustly, but quite really <laughs> accurately pushed pushed off to the side and, and disempowered? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I actually agree with you that I think that's the logic, but I think that we cannot disaggregate power and race. So I think that this sort of suggestion that it's only about power and it's not about race misses just the, the sort of same way that we miss the imbrication of race and religion and that those categories can't be simply, you know, sort of separated. I think the same is true with respect to whiteness and power. So that the minute that you align yourself with power in the systems that we have, in a system that is structurally racist, you, it, even if it's for your own survival, you've actually aligned yourself with racism. And I think that's the, the thing that we actually have to sort of face. And I, and I would say that it's not, and I wouldn't say it's only whiteness in the world. So I, as you know, I've done a lot of work on Hindu-Jewish alliances um, over India-Israel solidarities. So what's interesting there is that it's not whiteness because that's not the operative system in India, right? That's not the system of power in India, but it's Hindu supremacy. The Jews have repeatedly, you know, sort of sought to, to gain uh, access to. And that Hindu supremacy is a Hindu supremacy that is actually long standing ties with Nazi thinking about blood purity, with, with anti Semitic ideas, even at the same time as it disavows them. And so, and, and anti-Muslim ideas. So I think that I think that it is about power, but it's about power that has always been linked to racialized and religious systems that are profoundly disturbing and structurally inequitable. Thank you for that. And I, I, let me ask, let, I, I see that Anne is joining us and she'll have some more questions that come from listeners. Um, but I have a I have another question, which is a religious studies question. I I, I want to explore um, that analogy a, a little more because I know that in um, in purity systems in ancient Judaism, there's purity and there's impurity and there's purification processes. And purity isn't necessarily morally laden. It's a state that you move in and out of. And it seems like that porousness between purity and impurity doesn't move over into the racial thinking or into the political thinking that you've described today. So um, I guess I'd like to ask you to reflect on that. And also, I'd love it if you could help us expand our political imagination by pointing to some examples of where you think solidarity movements haven't been limited by this ideological purity standard? So that was a long, complicated question with two parts. Yeah, so I mean, the first part I think is, I think you're right, and um, that there are rituals of purification that exist in traditional uh, religious settings, and that in some contexts, like in, in Jewish traditional purity and impurity um, kind of situations, there are means of it, it's not morally laden, right? It, it's not linked to your uh, permanent state of being. It's a temporary state that you move in and out of. That said, it's still hierarchical, right? And so it still is, even at the same time as it's, it's doing that, it is still continually reinforcing that women are inferior to men through this system because they're more often impure and therefore more often untouchable, like quite literally, right? And so I think that I think that, yes, th that that develops that idea of, of the impossibility of sort of, or the permanence, maybe we should say, of a state of, of um, impurity um, gets mapped into the colonial project, into sort of racial purity, and also into Christian thinking where, as we talked about, sort of this purity of heart or um, purity of thought, right? And sort of Kantian ideas as well as Kierkegaard, right? Get mapped onto ideas of, of um, moral purity and virtue, right? And so Christians are virtuous and moral and pure in a way that Jews or Moors or, right, are not. And so I think that 
that's where then it becomes a stagnant idea that is connected to a kind of confessional ideology and the like. Um, I don't know if that answers it, but I do think it, it has evolved and become less fluid, as, as you're saying, or sort of less um, shiftable. Um, I, I, with respect to, I think there are many feminist alliances, and I do think BLM has worked really well. I think it has been a movement that people have come together across communities. And I think a lot of Jews actually, I think it pushed a lot of Jews, the initial sort of, um, the initial pushback against the BLM platform that, um, that mentioned Israel, a lot of Jews felt like they couldn't not support BLM, right? And so it, the Jewish community found a way, I think for the most part, to, to hold on to that alliance and to stand with the black community in this time of racial reckoning. But the very fact that there was a question about it, right? What did that mean for black Jews? What did that mean for, um, and what does it meant every time for Jews of color or for people who are in solidarity with prison reform or things for Angela Davis to be protested or disinvited or have awards like in Birmingham taken away from her because of her care and concern for Palestinian liberation, I think is, is, is disconcerting, right? So we have that on the one hand, but I do think there's lots, I think there's a lot of examples of, of sort of uh, feminist movements, um, which have also their own sort of amounts of white racism in them, um, but, but, um, but that have found ways to mobilize across difference. Thank you. And I'm gonna invite Anne to jump in with some questions um, from the Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really evocative and, and thought provoking. Um, I'm going to try to tie together some of the questions uh, because we only have a few minutes. So, th so there are a few um, who are uh, wanting to interrogate a little bit the solidarity between Jews and the Christian writer evangelicals. Um, and I think part of what some of those questions are getting at is the question of whether it's really solidarity or if it's just a kind of alliance in a cynical sense, right? So are you are, are people who are uh, aligning or partnering in this way um, actually participating in this politics of, of purity on their own terms? Or as, as somebody said, Israelis think they're hustling evangelicals, but who's hustling who, right? <laughs> right. So is it is it a much more um, tit for tat kind of situation? Um, and, and how does seeing it that way affect the framework that you're presenting? So I think that's, um... I think that is actually the sort of uh, mental justification or the intellectual justification or even the affective justification. Like when people look at themselves and say like, how can I, how could I do this? Well, I'm doing this because I'm actually just using them, right? But I, I don't think, I think it's um, a matter of semantics to say, oh, well, it's just a political alliance and not a solidarity when in fact you're taking their money, you're supporting them, you're electing them you are you know, having them speak. We don't have the kinds of rules that Hillel has. We, we don't, there's not written rules. I searched Hillel, right? The Hillel's platforms, I searched Federation platforms. There's all these things about not aligning with groups that have shown any association with, with BDS, which means many, many Muslim groups, right? That we had just basically writ large say, well, if you, if you have solidarities with, with these groups, we're ready to just cast you out, but not the same with respect. We, we're not only, you know, federations and JCRCs aren't just um, having alliances with these groups, they're honoring, right? They're like actually giving awards to Christian Zionists on a regular basis. So I think we have to actually interrogate, like we can apologize and come up with any kind of language we want for why this is really not a solidarity. But I think that the reality is you're supporting white supremacy and you're supporting anti-Semitism, whether you like it or not. And so I don't think it really, to me, it doesn't matter whether it uh, feels good or doesn't feel good or feels like you're duping them. The reality is you're supporting racism. I mean, I, I guess that, and that's where for me, the scholarship, the activism, they have to come together in that regard. Um, we have time for one more short one or should we? Okay. It's gonna, it's a big question, <laughs> but you can treat it um, briefly if you want. I think, um, so there's another question that asks about um, what makes, 
what makes us talk about, for example, Hillel's rules about this as representative of the Jewish community as opposed to, for example, J Street. And I think that might be part of a broader question about whether there are not the same, but similar or parallel um, sort of purity politics on the other side of, of the aisle. Right, well, I think, that's that is a big question. So I will say, like, for example, Eric Fingerhut, you know, pulled out of a J Street conference because on a different panel, not the one he was on, there was going to be um, Saeb uh, Erekat, I believe, who who was a Palestinian negotiator. And he refused to participate in the whole conference because uh, he was going to you know, be speaking at it. So, yes, that's the purity politics on that. end, And I do think it is fair to say that there is a kind of, and, and this is where, right, people will sort of talk about the purity politics on the left. I think it is fair to suggest that there are ways in which just as people don't understand the intersectionality, even the Jewish community is sometimes blind to the intersectionality of its own community, right, and the, the sort of complicated identities that mean that people don't have a single solidarity or a single commitment, right? We're not, we're not only committed to one you know, value and therefore we may find ourselves marching in the street with people who we don't ally ourselves with on other things. Um, I think the same is, is true with respect to certain um, politics on the left um, where, where we have seen a real pushback and sort of a narrow understanding of what Israel is or what Israel can mean or what, what a Jewish star can symbolize. And I do think that that is the case. On the other hand, I guess I, this is where I have to come back to the idea that all alliances aren't equal and, and we actually have to make choices and because nothing is pure, because there is no such thing as pure, there's always compromise. I'd rather compromise with the people who are suffering than the people who are white supremacists and I have to choose a compromise. So like I'd rather pick that kind of purity politics than I will the kind of purity politics that leaves out black people, women, gay people, you know, like let's, the list goes on. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's not about whether or not we'll make compromises, it's just which ones we're making. Um. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we'll have an opportunity to return to some of these issues uh, of activism, solidarity, identity um, in the next part of our program, but we are gonna make a transition now. I have some new people to welcome and I wanna invite those of you who are listening to take a breath, to stand up and stretch if you want to, uh, and to get ready for um, the second part of our time together, which is a round table that will allow us to reflect on some of the larger issues of race, religion, and the Jews that have emerged over the course of this whole lecture series. Um, I am delighted to be able to introduce everyone to uh, a special guest who is joining us for this discussion. Dr. Ana Lucia Lopez Reveredo. She is a Peruvian Chilean American Jutina, born in Peru and raised in Spain and the United States. An anti oppression activist, educator, and researcher, Ana Lucia founded Jutina Ico in 2019 to offer Latin Jews from around the world a platform in which to engage in critical dialogue about Jewish and Latin multiculturalism. Prior to starting Jutini Co, she was a principal investigator for the Center to Advance Racial Equity in Portland, Oregon, and a migrant rights advocate in California's Central Valley, Southwestern Mexico, and Southeastern Peru. Ana Lucia's educational background lies in critical race and cross-cultural studies and her doctoral research was centered around Latino immigration and refugee resiliency. A passionate global citizen, she's traveled to over 125 countries and has lived in five continents. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, also joining us for this conversation is Steve Weitzman, the director um, of the Cat Center for Advanced Judaic Studies uh and really the container of the of this whole series and um thank you to professor shauna sippy and to dr Ann albert for staying in this conversation um as we've moved over the course of this lecture series people might have noted um that we've taken a more activist turn for the last few weeks and i want to start with a general question for you dr lopez reverado because one of the things that we were hoping to explore um explicitly in this roundtable is the relationship between scholarship 
and activism. So going back to um, last summer, when Steve and I were first thinking about this series, we were motivated by the tremendous outpouring of activism that occurred around the world following the murder of George Floyd. So it, it's, um, it, it's, it's of note to, to me that um, this last conversation happens, happens this week. Um, but I, I think for some people who've been listening into the, uh, to these um, conversations, Sometimes it raises a question about what the theory, what the scholarship actually has to do with the reality of racism on the ground. So um, because you have a foot in both worlds as both a researcher and as an activist, um, I wanna invite you to tell us a little bit about your own doctoral research and how that scholarship has informed your activism uh, and your leadership. Thank you, Rabbi. It's wonderful to be here. It's interesting, my, my field, I come from a school of social work and social research. And so for me, uh, activism always felt like it was an embedded part of the work we were doing, uh, specifically with a, a school focused on anti-oppression. And what does it mean to be very clear on how oppression and systems of oppression lie within our, our, our world um, and how various people, regardless of one's identity, have roles in, in uplifting and ensuring that these systems continue. And so, you know, for myself, like my doctoral research particularly focused on the experience of, of immigrants and refugees who for their entire trajectory uh, from leaving their, their, leaving their home to getting to their new place was a, not only a feeling of displacement, but also a feeling of wherever it is that I'm going to go, already this ingrained idea that there was something deficit of their own experience that where they were going was going to require a lot of attention to becoming much more receptive and much more um, be, be filled with whatever type of work we were, wherever it is that we were going culturally and uh, so on and so forth. And so with my work, it was more about flipping the idea around what's missing versus and, and, and focus more on what's being contributed based on the different communities that are coming, specifically with regards to thinking about the world, with regards to um, ways in which their culture had informed their daily patterns of living that could supplement and really be complementary to the communities in which they were joining. And really just kind of switching the idea as to what does immigrant integration actually look like and why has it always been so focused on, okay, like once immigrants come here, we need to fill them up with everything that they don't have and everything that comes before them should be left behind. So taking an approach around like, how do we kind of untangle ourselves from that supremacist type of thinking that in order for us, in order for them to be successful, they're going to have to relinquish so much of who they are. Um, I really saw it as empowered, empowered research and really just empowered community-based practice. And so why I think that's important, you know, in my work, specifically focus on supporting Latin Jews to think of both of their identities as, you know, the Latino Latinx identity and the Jewish identity as complementary to one another. There is not one that is superior. There is not one that is deficit. There are two that exist. If those two identities are important to them, that truly carry them you know, through this life and inform how they love, how they, how they learn, how they celebrate. Uh, and all those things need to be evaluated from a, a space of, of joy and a space of resiliency and a space of worth. And so it's interesting to look at scholarship and activism because at times when on the ground, there is, we have to do a lot of uh, demystifying you know, scholarship. And at times, you know, when it comes to the academy, there's this desire to intellectualize everything. But when we're talking about things on the ground, that's continuously being a tool to stay elitist and a, and a tool to separate. It's like there is our own forms of supremacy that exist within the academy. And when it comes to activism, it's how do we untangle all of these things that we ourselves have become biased to, that we ourselves thrive in and we've found a way in which to succeed in but when it comes to activism, can feel a lot more isolating and a lot more of a reason to separate ourselves from what's happening on the ground. And I think for myself as a woman of color, as a Latina in academia, being you know, one of the smallest communities, uh, identifying communities within, uh, within the academy, it's important for me to recognize that I have to do a lot more code switching when it comes to like my activities that I'm incorporating scholarship. And I also recognize and wanting to move certain needles forward, 
towards prioritizing the advancement of, of racial equity and the dismantling of white supremacy that we can't get so stuck on theory. And, and I love theory, don't get me wrong. I love thinking about things through a, a wider perspective, but when it comes to action, we sometimes get so stuck in our head that we forget, okay, so what are the next steps that are actually gonna make what I'm thinking and what I'm saying are my ethical values and are, are my driving values for why I want something to advance and actually putting it into action. Um, thank you for that. And I, I think I'd like to bring Shauna back into the conversation now. Shauna, we invited you to speak here um, because of your scholarship. And part of your scholarship is studying um, social movements and religious movements. And so now I'd like to speak to you as someone who is both a scholar and an activist and really ask the same question. What relationship do you see uh, between scholarly research uh, and um, work for change, uh, anti-racism, anti-oppression work. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I think, um, Ana Lucia, I think everything, everything that she said is, is, is incredibly important for us to think about that you have, we have to sort of not get so stuck in our own theoretical heads and our exercises that we, we don't think about what's happening on the ground or we, or, or it's, or it's paralyzing. I think sometimes the complexity of it can, um, can make us feel like there's no there's no way forward. So I, I think that um, for me, I think it's it's I've come back around to recognizing that no scholarship is is neutral or that I don't want to just engage in exercises that are only academic um, and that you know I've never only been interested in it, but I think, there's two levels, I think, on which this activism happens. One is, is sort of within the academy for me. It is really mentoring students of color. It is working with colleagues and other women of color to, to think about um, what, what sort of higher education and the ways in which that system reproduces certain kinds of white supremacy all the time, right? It's a colonial invention in many ways, the, the academy as we, as we know it. And sort of how, how we reproduce through the system um, certain kinds of structural racism and, and the like. So I think there's work to be done sort of at the level of academia um, and, and with our students and with other colleagues. And then I think that, that there's, there's work on the ground um, that um, is, you know, is about sort of making these choices. And so for me, I think the, the realization of how complex things are is actually about a process and sort of, you have to go through an intellectual process of deciding and prioritizing what, what issues you're gonna care about and what compromises you're gonna make. And so I think I get back to this, this question of, I think the academic work can help us to sift through what's really happening and, and what kinds of alliances we wanna make. And so, you know, right, something can seem like a simple alliance, right? And, and, and as was the case sort of after the terrorist attacks in Mumbai um, that happened when the Chabad house was hit, one of the main things that happened were all these Hindu uh, Jewish like sort of memorial services that seemed relatively benign and, and sort of beautiful mourning the loss of people. But as I started to look at them, I was like, well, whose loss is not also being acknowledged, right? The, the Muslim community that lost as many people as Hindus and more than Jews in India at that time was totally not a part of those memorial services that were being organized across the world because a certain kind of alliance was being privileged over others. And again, it's not that there wasn't real loss in that moment for Hindus and Jews, but there was real loss for other people not based on religion. And so I think that helped me sort of interrogate what even something that seems like a benign or beautiful engagement might be and then helps us think about how we maybe can shift the terrain or or make new kinds of connections so i guess that's what i would say but it's an ongoing process so i i want to bring um steve and ann into the conversation now um as we reflect a little bit on things that we've learned over the course of this of this whole semester um, as, as Shauna mentioned at the beginning of her talk, one of our goals uh, in this whole series was to look at how race and religion are always interconnected and interrelated. And um, one of our uh, working assumptions was that the Jewish story was an important, was an important one for understanding uh, that relationship. 
So Steve, let me turn to you first. What are some of the big takeaways um, from uh, the series for you? Well, I think it's going to take me a while to process the whole the whole experience. So um, you'll have to forgive me that this is a little um, shallow. But um, you know, to speak personally rather than academically, I will say that um, you know, like so many of us, I was you know born into a position in life, a, a, an identity, a status, a way of seeing myself and the way other people see me, and um, it all doesn't fit together very well. So, you know, I, I'm born into a Jewish identity. I'm, um, I'm white. I was born into a certain class. And, um, you know, those all intersect with each other, but not necessarily in a coherent way. And so this series um, has given me an opportunity, you know, listening to so many wonderful people, to kind of think uh, a little bit more deeply about the different dimensions of, of my identity and how they relate to each other and how they formed each other. You know, I, I knew that I was Jewish and I was white, but I, I'm not sure I fully understood or understand even now um, how those co-constitute each other. Um, and so hopefully this series has helped people kind of think about the different dimensions of their identity and how they're connected to each other in ways that maybe, you know, aren't obvious. Um, how, for example, Jew, Jewishness and whiteness affect each other um, as opposed to just being like, you know, one on top of the other. So I think that's one of the big takeaways I, I, I come away with. Um, thanks, and, uh, and I'm gonna look to you uh, also for, for your, if you, if you wanna answer that question about what some big takeaways are for you personally, but also I look to you as sort of the keeper of the collective wisdom uh, and um, you've been reviewing all these rich questions and comments that have been collecting in the Q&A. And I know that after each lecture, we end with the sense of, oh, wow, we could have talked about these questions for another hour and not gotten to the depths of things. Um, so I guess my question is, do you have any takeaways and are there lingering questions that we can take some moments now to explore together? Yeah, it has really been, I mean, I guess the, the thing I'll say on a personal level is that it has been really eye-opening a true education to read just the questions. I mean, listening to the lectures, of course, but the people who've been attending these talks and posting their questions have raised all kinds of really erudite and informed um, ideas and questions that I just haven't been able to translate into this forum because of limited time. So that's been amazing. Um, I really have seen that there's just a vast public out there who are eager to, to take these things up. Um, in terms of, um, thematic takeaways, I think, yeah, there, there are a few things that really stand out to me as having been consistently raised. So one of them is the sense that Jews are in a kind of double bind and trying to figure out um, how to make sense of the fact that on the one hand, Jews, Judaism, the Jewish community do have a problem with racism, with benefiting from systematic racism, from being complicit, even sometimes actively harmful within and beyond the Jewish community. And at the same time, also being quite clearly discriminated against, right? Being the victims of anti-Semitism, um, even being kind of most directly in the crosshairs of um, the fiercest kind of violent rhetoric and ideologies on the far right. So there are both things happening at the same time. So I see a lot of questions that are like, but how can we say that Jews are racist when everyone hates us, <laughs> right? Um, there's just a lot of that that comes out in a lot of different ways. And I think that in, in, um, in a number of different topics, we, we pulled some of those threads in very helpful ways, but I did see it as just a pressing concern. Um, another one is, uh, and I think Steve, Steve brought this up and it's very consistently coming up is, how Jewishness relates to whiteness, um, how Jews and Judaism fit into a racial state and a kind of modern racialized society that we live in, um, both in the kind of historical terms, like are Jews white? How did they come to be seen as white? Is whiteness a real thing, <laughs> right? And that gets us then into stuff that we haven't really talked much about in the series, which is pulling apart, really kind of presenting critical race theory and asking, you know, in what ways race is constructed 
and how Jews have been a part of those constructions, right? So that's that's something that I see kind of nagging. Um, and then the last piece I would raise, and you know, if anybody wants to take these things up, I, I would welcome it. But the, but the last piece, just quickly, I would raise is where is religion in all of this, um, right? So Jews, race, and religion. It seems like we've talked more about Jews and race than the religion piece. Um, Mira, in your first talk, you really focused on that. But since then, it has felt like we've really looked at the side of Jewishness that's ethnic and embodied and social and political rather than in um, whatever it may be, ritual or rabbinic law or any other parts of, of kind of religious Judaism, right? So um, there have been on occasion questions from the audience that ask really particular questions about, about aspects of Jewish religion, but it's been frankly difficult to incorporate them into the, the sort of central thread. So that's what I would say. This is a great overview. Um, and I'm gonna use the three themes that you identified to try to organize, I, I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but to try to sort of organize our talk uh, uh, as, we, as we go forward. So I wanna um, note, that even as we've been having this lecture series, I know that Steve has also been teaching a class for undergraduates. So this is a nice shout out to all the Penn students who've been studying uh, uh, the Jews, race, and, and religion. And um, one of the readings for that course uh, had to do with the relationship between whiteness and Jewishness and the history of white Jews. So white, if, I don't even know how to talk talk about this, but white Jews becoming white. So Steve, I wonder if you can sort of just briefly engage the literature on how Jews became white. And then I want to invite our other guests um, to reflect on, on, on that question as well. Yeah, there's been a lot of research on that. I mean, um, a lot of it has to do with the United States. So we have to remember that the United States has, you know, its own racialized culture and things work differently in other parts of the world. Um, and whiteness means something different in different parts of the world. But um, you know, I have in mind, you know, scholars like Eric Goldstein, The Price of Whiteness, you know, which is already, you know, probably two decades old, old already. Um, and basically, it's a story of, you know, immigrants coming to the United States, um, ascribed a certain kind of racial identity in you know, Europe, um, or not ascribed a racial identity at all, coming into the United States, entering into the American racialized culture and not, you know, clearly fitting in, but pretty quickly realizing the advantages of being white and um, not unambivalent about that by any means and having to negotiate that, but um, seeing the advantages of aligning themselves with that. And then increasingly over the 20th century, um, coming to be seen by others and seeing themselves as white and with all that means and with all that, um, with all the implications of that, but never in an uncomplicated or unambivalent way. So um, that's kind of the story that I, I know from the scholarship. Um, and throughout it all, um, Jews have been um, white, but not quite, I guess. They've been ambivalent about that identity. And that has led them on a somewhat different trajectory than other groups identified as white. But nevertheless, um, they become part of the story of whiteness in America. So that's that's in a nutshell the story that I know. Um, that's really helpful, and it, it's interesting how you started that response because when I first connected with Ana Lucia, you'll remember I had said, well, one of the things that we might want to talk about that keeps coming up again and again is the relationship between Jewishness and whiteness. And Ana Lucia, I don't know if you remember, but you looked at my question and you were like, oh, this is so American. Um, so uh, I'd love for you to be able to address international aspects of the question of Jews, race, and religion, but also to update that story uh, of Jews and whiteness, bringing it um, into the current moment based on your experiences and um, expertise. Yeah, well, it's interesting because non-white non Jews, okay, so Jews of color, uh, the global majority of Jews, like I said, are the global majority of Jews in the world, um, as well as in Israel, but are largely invisible and are exploited both in the United States and in Israel. And I think it's important to note that. And and I I, I made that comment about being uh, pride of American questions because the way in which we think uh, white I equate to power, and yes, whiteness um, around the world and a proximity to whiteness is what's going to allow in systems in which 
a small group can only be the ones who are going to be at the top. So capitalist systems primarily in which we can only have a small ruling community, that's going to equate to whiteness. And around the world, even though like in Latin America, we don't think about whiteness the same way. We, we really have this desire to connote uh, national identities because we think that when we focus on race, we're uh, creating, we're separating communities, which uh, I, I understand the desire to move that way, but racism is still such an embedded part of everything that we do. You know, all you need to do is look at the media, you know, who's on telenovelas, who's, uh, you know, who are the popular singers. They're primarily representing a certain racialized identity that we have a little bit more of a clear, like we're able to name a little bit more clearly in the United States. Um, similarly in France, uh, my partner is French and the majority of French Jews, you know, uh, uh, largely are Jews that are, uh, that come from North Africa and really started to, um, as a result of the number of Jews that were living pre-World War II, leaving France or being interned, the majority of Jews that populate France today are, are Sephardim, uh, Mizrahim, who have a different identity and who their own understanding of what does it mean to be French is always convoluted because on one end, you know, they're, they're thought of as French, but like outside of the world, they're thought of as French, but in France, you know, they're North African, but in the United States, they're considered white. You know, so there's a lot of differences when it comes to who white is. And similarly, we can have that same conversation about, you know, who white is in Israel. Like over, you know, Israel is, is fairly new. And so it's interesting to be watching what's happening and, 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 and recognizing that we're talking about, you know, just, just over 70 years old. So fairly young. Um, and also like a desire to replicate a lot of what was happening around the world in terms of successful governments, which were, you know, American governments that were ruled by an idea of whiteness and in order and, and had to kind of survive with that notion. And over the last 20 years, particularly over the last 30 years at this point, we saw a, I mean, a ton of migration from the former Soviet Union. And we saw a ton of mig and we saw in the 80s, the majority of the migration from uh, the Ethiopian Jews. And, you know, it's interesting because both of those groups were experienced an immense amount of discrimination when they entered uh, when they entered Israel, where they when they went into other diaspora communities, the difference is that you know 30 years from now, so you know a couple more generations to go, uh, the the Jew that that have from Russian descent, you know the Jew whose grandparents were born in Russia in the early 90s, and the Jews whose grandparents were born in Ethiopia in the 80s, they're going to still have very different. They're going to have a difference Some, somehow. You know the, they might both have the name Gal and Tal but there's still gonna be a racial difference there that's going to continue to play out. And yet there's still like not a clear keen desire to wanna to think about race in this context. And so, so one of the questions came up like, you know, whiteness, like is this, is this even a thing? It's, it's not, but it is, you know, like we understand that this is all racially constructed, but it means something. And we've made it mean something because of our, 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 insist, our incessant desire to keep certain, power th certain powerful things at play. Um, and like, like uh, Dr. Weitzman said, like there is a, there was an understanding of there's something here when it comes to being white and I might not be there yet, but I can strive to get there. And eventually that is what happened. And there was a lot of benefits to, you know, primarily like in the 1950s, 1960s, Jews becoming white when it came to access to higher education, when it came to access to buying their first homes, access that wasn't made available to black folks who had been living in the United States for longer periods of time. And so I think that that's, those are real clear understandings. And so when, um, I think when we're talking, talking about race and even though we might not necessarily, uh, even though we might have a very a complicated relationship to what that means, we need to be able to hold comp the complication in one hand, like something that's co complicated in one hand and also recognize that despite its complication, like we've still benefited greatly from that. And I think that that's just kind of like the, the fluidity of, you know, identity and that, that what we need to take in this moment in time. So, Shonda, let me bring you into the conversation. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in what Ana Lucia suggested. To, to what degree do all Jews benefit from the association of Jewishness and whiteness, even Jews who aren't white? Is that something we can talk about? Do you see that happening? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think we can, depending on where we are um, in the world. And I, I also think that um, I think it's tricky, right? I, what what um, Steve, what you're talking about, about sort of 
being white and not white, I think that I think that it's useful to think about proximate whiteness, right? And you can benefit from white privilege and you can benefit from, and you can be white passing and you can, but I actually think this is where, and, and this is where Ana Lucia was talking about sort of that complexity of identity. I think that the reality because of the, the sort of real power of white nationalist groups, right? And this ideology means that Jews haven't fully arrived at white, even white Jews, right? Even white Jews who have complete benefit of white privilege in 99.9% .9 of the, you know, sort of context of America, there's still places in which you're still, you're not going to be fully white. And that's where whiteness and Christianness and a particular kind, right? Even black Christians can't ever achieve that, right? Because those categories come to be imbricated. So whiteness, if the sort of hierarchical top level of, of this system of domination is about a particular kind of white Christianness, right? And I think that that's part of where when we talk about religion, right? We, we, um, we need to see those categories as connected. And I think, I mean, one thing that I find really troubling, right, is, is sort of when you hear Spencer praise the state of Israel um, and, and Zionism, because of the fact that he views it as an ideology, right? Um, that that is, uh, you know, an ideology that is focused on ethnic cleansing, right? <laughs> and he thinks that that's what what uh, you know that's his goal as well. Then we sort of have to wonder about sort of where is where is whiteness or how does a kind of of supremacy function in Israel, right? And how like that's what I'm talking like we we see Hindu supremacy in India right now, right? As a part of Hindu nationalism, and so what are the sort of what are the sort of different forms of hierarchy and supremacy that function in different places? I think is worth talking about. So I I agree that even Jews of color benefit from the fact that. The majority of Jews in the United States benefit from white privilege, and the majority of Jews in the United States are still of Ashkenazi origin, and therefore institutions have been built and access has paved the way. And so there's all of these privileges, financial as well as sort of entree into worlds, that often Jews of color get because of that. But they're still barred at the door all the time, too, right? They still experience racism, even in those institutions where they have access. Um, so I think that, I think it's just not clean. I think, I think you know, what, what is very clear to me, and, um, and I guess I wanna get back to part of what, um, what Anne, what you talked about, about sort of the religious piece of this is that I actually think these are all parts of, of sort of contemporary American rituals, right? So the going to the pride, you know, parade, but to, just going with your synagogue and waving your flag, that is a, a religious ritual now in America, right? And I don't think we can um, sort of separate that from, you know, what happens at the bar mitzvah, um, you know, and that that's like a religious ceremony and this is not, because I think this sort of performance of identity has become a, a huge aspect and certainly the performance of nationalism. Um, has become a huge aspect of American Jewish religious life. Um, it's why we have, you know, since the 1950s, you know, 50s, uh, you know a, an American flag and an Israeli flag in a lot of synagogue spaces, right? So those, those I guess I, I sort of push back against the idea that that isn't religion at work, right? I just think it's a new set of rituals and a new set of ways that people are finding meaning um, in these articulations, but I'll stop there. Thanks, and I, I want to circle back to Steve uh, and uh, invite you now to pick up this religion question. Um, how, how have you seen our dialogues about Jewish identity um, helping us to complicate or enrich our notions of Jewish identity? And, and, and where, where does ritual fit into that? Where do ethics and values fit into that? Um, any, any thoughts on, on the question of where religion fits into the story? Uh, we struggled with that question. You know, you mentioned this class that's accompanying the series and we've struggled um, with the religion part of the class because it's, for one thing, it's so difficult to define uh, religion. And, you know, there's such a, 
it's a term that means different things in different contexts. And, um, you know, as Shana was just pointing out, um, you can locate, you know, the boundary between religion and the secular is not always clear. And what many people might identify as the civic or the secular um, can have religion-like components. Um, so it's really, really difficult to um, draw a circle around what religion is. Um, part of the reason we want, I thought Jews were a great case study in understanding the interaction between religion and race is because you know, religion and race and ethnicity and nationhood, they all mix together in complicated ways in Jewish identity. Um, so um, we've struggled with that over the course of the semester, but what I did, there were two kind of takeaways that I guess I wanted to highlight. One is that um, if people were here for the very first lecture, I evoked a very famous um, speech by Abraham Joshua Heschel, where he saw religion and race as the opposite of each other. Religion offered a solution to the problem of race. Religion is what tied people together. Um, race is what divides people. And um, you know that was a view he articulated 50 years ago. And I think we have a different perspective now where we can see how, for example, Christianity and whiteness um, you know, intermix in complicated ways or how you know, being you know, Jewish and black is, is, is complicated and different from being you know, uh, Jewish and Asian, for example. Um, so I really wanted to um, you know, not spend time on rel religion as a separate thing and race as a separate thing, but really kind of explore their interconnection. So I feel like my, I'm, I'm blabbering on too long, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, no, that's really fine. I, I, I this um, the first point that Anne made. I want to get back to because it has come up again and again, and I don't know if there's a question here as much uh, as an acknowledgement that I'd invite anyone who wants to to weigh in on um, about this double bind, um, because uh, as as Shauna mentioned, even as um, white Jews especially have all of these doors open because of white privilege, um, Jewishness still means um, that there are places where discrimination is real um, and we are all limited in different ways um, by racialized thinking. Um, so um, acknowledging that double bind, was there a question in there, Anne? I, I mean, I feel, I, I think there's a sense um, of, of pushback against it because it's hard to hold both of these truths together at the same time. Um, and I think maybe it's new learning for um, white Jews about uh, about the privileges that we have. Was there a question about that that we can turn to the to the panel on? I don't know if I don't know if I can put it into a question very well. Um, I I guess I I suppose that another maybe the way to do it is this another a fourth thing that I didn't mention is that the questions very often turned to what can we do, right? Like so much of what we've talked about as I think I think um, Shana said this and then Steve said it in a different way and a lot of what um, Lucia said that, that it's not clean. These things are not clean, right? Like Steve, it's true. Like it's a, it's almost a cliche in teaching Judaism to undergrads that you talk about, you know, is Judaism um, a people, a people or a religion, right? And that an ethnicity or a religion. And, and the answer is always like both and neither and it's complicated and that's why we're talking about it, right? Um, and I think that's, that's what we've done here. And it's been like a really teachable moment to, to show how not uncomplicated those things are. So, okay, once you get to that point, then so many people are like, all right, <laughs> like, how can I help fix it? Like, what can I do either in my community or in my reading or in my relationships? And so I guess that's what I would say as the question, given that we have scholar activists, Great, thanks for your help moving us toward a question. And since we're moving to the end of our time, um, that's really helpful. Let me also say in terms of next steps that by now you might have in your inbox, everybody who's listening an email inviting you to do a quick survey and an invitation for feedback. And um, we'd like these conversations to continue and we'd like to be a part of them. So please give us your feedback and help us sort of look, look ahead to next steps for our programs. 
Um, but for individuals, um, what are some next steps now that sort of we're confronting the reality of racism, of how white supremacy um, seems um, so powerful uh, in um, American culture, especially. Um, oh, it looks like Ana Lucia might be frozen. Can you hear me? Let me start with Shauna. Shauna, what are some I next can hear you. steps? Oh, you can hear me. Okay, so Ana Lucia, next steps for individuals, for action or for learning. So I guess there's two things I'd say. I, you know, I'm noticing that there is a, a real concern with the idea that um, the Jewish community is not one monolithic thing or does not think in one way. And I, we do need to acknowledge the sort of vast uh, complexity of difference that exists even within the American Jewish community. And I know that um, there are many Jews of color who are very invested in the idea of Judaism as a religion, right? And using that category because it seems like it does in some ways what Heschel, you know, it sort of was promising in that it, it sort of erases race from a, from from a kind of point of entry, right? Like that, that, that you, you need to sort of fit into a certain category. So I think we, I think we need to be attentive to, to that all the time. I, I guess for me, if, if we're talking about Jews watching this um, and, you know, and what, what can be done, I think really asking the Jewish community um, with respect to, and this is what I was talking about in my talk, not Jewish community at large or not all Jews, but the organized Jewish community as far as our institutions, right? And where the money and power is for the most part. So what does it mean to ask our institutions to really account for race and to really think about how racism is functioning and, and we are participating in white supremacy, right? How are Jewish institutions embedded in systems of white supremacy, even in contexts where they think they aren't. And doing that work is really hard, but how to interrogate that and really think about that and dismantle those systems, I think is the first step, sort of trying to think about who your alliances are with and what you're doing and who you're choosing to help and who you're not choosing to help and how, you know, whether that's, that's help in a context of a white savior kind of you know, vein, which I think is how the Jewish community frames a lot of tikkun olam discourse is still actually employing a sort of, you know, white supremacist, white savior rhetoric. And I, so I think there's even things at the level of repairing the world or being a light unto the nations that we really need to interrogate that are about hubris and supremacy that actually are part of Jewish supremacy. And so I think, you know, starting with interrogating Jewish supremacy and white supremacy, and the participation of Jewish organizations and Jews in that is sort of the first place to, to start. Okay, Not so either. I want to acknowledge that Shauna has named another double bind, which is, uh, especially for white Jews like me, wanting to be helpful, but not wanting to be hubristic and a white savior. So with all of, with that double bind in mind, I want to invite Ana Lucia uh, to help suggest um, some next steps. People who've been part of the yeah. series want to know what what to do next in terms of learning or in terms of action against uh, racism. Yeah, right on. So to advance like racial equity and racial justice, uh, this work takes time. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, this work is going to take a lot of time. Okay, um, like I was mentioning, this work is going to take time. And one of the ways in which, and I, I love what Dr. Sabi was just mentioning with regards to, it's so imperative that we recognize how white supremacy. Oh no, I'm sorry to say that we lost you. It's within us. And this is where we really get to examine a lot of internalized rest. And there's some really good work. Okay, I'm going to keep going. You know what, I, we're, you're coming in and out. And so I want to invite you to email me what you, what you said, because we weren't able to catch it. And that way we will be able to share it with listeners. Um, please, please do. It's, it's, um, and um, you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, what we were able to hear is that uh, this is hard work and that it takes time. 
And so I'm going to thank you uh, for that wisdom, uh, which seems a, a good place to end on. Um, thank you all for participating today. Uh, thank you all for participating over the course of the semester. Um, and um, to be continued, the learning will continue uh, and the action will continue. So thank you for joining us.